Hello, this is Dr. Adi Gana from the American Hip Institute with our talk on femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. The hip is a synovial ball and socket joint that allows for the articulation of the femoral head, which acts as the ball, with the acetabulum, which acts as the socket. The labrum surrounds the rim of the acetabulum and contributes to the stability of the joint by increasing the contact area of the joint itself and maintaining the negative suction seal and pressure. In femoral acetabular impingement, there are two types of morphologies that can result in impingement. One can occur in the neck, and one can occur on the osseous rim. A cam deformity relates to the femur and causes bony changes on the junction of the head and the neck. This results in the loss of the contour and sphericity of the femoral head as it approaches the neck. The pincer relates to the acetabulum. It happens when excess bone forms on the rim and increases the coverage of the head. Which gives us three basic FAI morphologies. An isolated cam lesion, an isolated pincer lesion, or mixed morphology. CAM morphology is probably more commonly reported in male patients, although recent studies show that symptomatic CAM is more equally distributed between women and men. On the other hand, pincer morphology is more common in young to middle-aged women. Most cases of FAI occur in active individuals, particularly those engaged in athletics or in occupations that require repetitive hip flexion and repetitive hip internal rotation. Cam deformities can happen anywhere on the femoral neck, but they're more common on the anterolateral side, although they can also extend more anteriorly and more lateral as well. Other anatomic abnormalities that can lead to impingement include a non-spherical but congruent head as well as a short femoral neck. This leads to decreased head neck offset and increases the contact area between the neck and the rim. In flexion and internal rotation, the cam lesion causes shearing and compressive stress on the labrum, which can lead to tears. As the tear progresses, this can lead to delamination of the cartilage. Think of it as a cheese grinder effect. The more it comes into contact with the rim, the more stress and more damage it can cause to the labrum and it can extend into the cartilage. The following diagram can help illustrate how as the neck approaches the acetabular rim, the cam deformity can tear through the labrum and start grinding down on the cartilage and that chondral labral junction. In pincer morphology, the deformity can be focal or it can be widespread, and this leads to different injury patterns. Patients can have different variations in the coverage, and this also plays a role in FAI. For example, in acetabular retroversion, where the rim is oriented looking back, can lead to focal overcoverage in the front of the femur and cause abutment of the labrum and neck. A deep acetabulum, known as coxa profunda, can cause global overcoverage and can lead to impingement throughout the hip range of motion. A more extreme form of deep acetabulum, known as petrusio acetabuli, can also occur and causes worse symptoms. In patients with pincer deformities, repetitive flexion leads to compression and repetitive bruising of the interior labor. This repetitive bruising causes the labrum to hypertrophy and become ossified. So in patients with pincer deformities, we see more ossified labrums rather than cartilage damage, which is more commonly seen in cam deformities. 
Also, in patients with pincer deformities, a significant overcoverage can cause a lever effect, which pushes the head posteriorly and back, causing injury to the posterior cartilage and posterior labrum in deep flexion. This is known as a countercoup lesion. Patients can present with a variety of symptoms. The insidious onset of the affected hip typically starts in the groin. The pain can also start in the interior thigh. It can also start in the greater trochanteric area, the lower back, and in the buttocks. In addition to pain, well, most patients will complain of mechanical symptoms, such as clicking, snapping, and locking. Specific hip movement, including flexion, Joint loading and rotation provoke these symptoms, and they can happen during physical activity. But over time, they can also occur during activities of daily living. Periods of prolonged hip flexion, such as sitting or sitting, uh, driving or sitting at a desk all day, can cause symptoms as well. When asked to localize their pain, the patients will usually cup their hand around the hip. This is known as the C sign, denoting intraarticular pain. Since physical examination is sensitive, but not very specific to the FAI, we need to focus on determining whether the pain is coming from the hip itself or it's due to extra-articular pathology. Full range of motion should always be examined, paying particular attention to flexion and internal rotation. Restricted internal rotation with hip flexion is very indicative of a higher risk for femoral travel impingement. When it comes to special tests, our most reliable one is the impingement test, or veneer, also known as flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. And it's our go-to for anterior impingement. Positive test is when we can reproduce the patient's symptoms. Initial evaluation can be carried out with plain x-rays. On an AP view, the loss of normal sporosity can be seen we call this a pistol grip deformity. The done view shows the interior superior aspect of the head neck junction, better identifying the cam deformity. It shows the alpha angle, which measures the amount of deviation from the normal sphericity. For pincer deformities, we can look at an IP view to look for signs of focal and global overcoverage, but traversion can be identified with a crossover sign where the posterior and interior walls intersect. The lateral center edge angle can also be used, which is the angle between the vertical axis and the line between the rim and the center of the head. Normal angles between 25 and 39, anything beyond 39 is considered a pincer deformity. Coxa profunda and protusia acetabuli can be assessed by looking at the ilioitial line. If the cup passes the line, it's a coxa profunda. If the head of the femur passes this line, then it's a protusia acetabuli. A false profile view can be used to measure the interior coverage by using the interior center edge angle between a vertical line and the line between the edge of the rim and the center of the femoral head. An angle beyond 40 degrees is considered a pincer deformity. Advanced imaging modalities, such as MRI and CT scans, allows for a more detailed evaluation of the patient's hips. The MRI can help us identify label tears, as well as chondral defects associated with FAI. And in conjunction with a CT scan, it can give us a better understanding of the bony morphology.
When in doubt, we can use diagnostic intraarticular injections to make sure that the pain is coming from the hip itself and isolate other causes such as back problems. Treatment typically starts with conservative options, you know, such as physical therapy, activity modification, medication, and in some cases, injections. If symptoms persist, we need to start thinking about surgical treatment. It's imperative that symptomatic patients that have failed non-operative treatment seek out surgical counseling. This is due to the fact that several long-term studies show a faster progression of arthritis in patients that don't get any treatment compared to patients that undergo surgery. Surgical treatment has evolved and has come a long way. Before, we required big incisions and surgical dislocations in order to address all of the pathology. Now, we're using a minimal invasive approach with the use of arthroscopy. By using a couple of pinhole incisions, we're able to introduce all of the equipment and properly treat all of the lesions that we see inside of the hip. The goal of the surgery is to correct the bony morphology of both the rim and the femoral neck. And at the same time, we can address any tears in the labrum and cartilage. Our goal is to provide an impingement free motion. And very importantly, when addressing the cam lesion, we have to ensure that the spherical contour is restored. We're always looking for that perfect sphere. Take a look at the uh, image on the left. It's a patient before surgery with a big cam deformity of the femoral neck. And on the right side, we have the same patient after undergoing surgery with a complete resection of the deformity. This is definitely one of the most critical steps we take during our surgeries. In an investigation carried out at our institution, we were able to show Big cam deformities lead to higher grade cartilage damage, lower survivability, and poor outcome scores. Patients with big cams or with an alpha angle larger than 55 degrees had a faster progression to arthritis and to a conversion to a total hip replacement. We were able to show that a successful femoroplasty or resection of the cam is the same as having no cam at all. The impact of the study is that we were able to prove that femoroplasty changes the natural history of arthritis. We can prevent arthritis and slow its progression. After surgery, the patient will start physical therapy right away. During the first few weeks, the patient will be fitted with a hip brace. This limits their flexion and abduction in order to protect our repaired labrum, and it limits their hip extension in order to protect our capsule closure. Depending on the extent of surgery, patients will be placed on crutches anywhere from two to six weeks with progressive weight bearing. We initiate our comprehensive post-operative program. We focus our activity on isometric strength exercises, restoring the proper gait pattern, protecting the tissue healing, and ROM exercises. After 12 to 16 weeks, we can move into more extensive and intensive training with a return to sports around the six to nine month mark. Patients will continue to improve throughout that first year. Thanks so much for listening to our talk. If you have any doubts or any questions, feel free to contact us.